Thank you, Axel. Thank you, um, Igor. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, it's a great meeting. So I thought you meant secreted life when you said, uh, okay, that's my only dad joke for the... <laughs> I didn't realize the title would lead to actually a session. So I'm going to talk about uh, extremely phyllic red algae, um, something that you probably don't know a lot about. So I'll give a little bit of introduction to it. And uh, some culture work that was done by a, a great student, Julia Van Etten, in our group, who has been working with the, through our CSP project with our friends at the JGI to generate a huge amount of data. I'll talk about the first pass of this data and some of the interesting insights that's providing us and the team who submitted that that proposal and uh, project shown up here. So red algae are really cool, obviously by definition. They are, and they're very important in many ways. There's most of you know red algae either as a nori, a sushi wrap on your, you know, on your uh, on your food, or you know it as, as sort of parts of soups and so on. But they're also very important for phycocolloids, agar carrageenan, the therapeutic uses, fertilizer. Lots of different morphologies, but they're all pseudoparenchyma. They're not like true plants. They have like fused uh, filaments that make up the multicellular bodies. Really interesting in many ways. I'm gonna ignore the massive biodiversity of red algae and red seaweeds and look at the smallest part of the red algal tree of life, which are the cyanidiophyce, which are the extremophilic red algae. And here's a famous one of those called Galdieria. And there's maybe 14 species so far in this group, but this is an ancient, ancient lineage in the red algal and the eukaryote tree of life. So we've been working on the red algae for a while and they have some pretty crazy features that I think it's important for people to understand is that um, our group and others have more or less validated that in the split of what we, within what's called the Archaeplastida, the red green glaucophyte algae, about a quarter of the gene inventory was lost from the ancestor of the red algal lineage, the Rhodophyta, and with it went a bunch of really standard eukaryotic features like flagellum-based motility, phytochromes, macroautophagy, the cytoskeleton became very much less complex as in other eukaryotes. So somehow this lineage went through a very stressful and very sort of selective time. A lot of genes were lost that are standard in eukaryotes. On top of that, the group I'll talk about, the cyanidiophytina, also the same extreme phyllic group, they also lost a bunch of genes. So this is a really interesting lineage. You can look at the core KO numbers that are you know, shared amongst all these different algae and plants. The ones in red, you can see how few of these sort of uh, core uh, metabolic genes they have. So they have all the standard genes to survive as free living organisms, but they have really shrunk the gene families, introns, lots of things. So that makes them really interesting uh, uh, models. The other great thing is that they've adapted uh, to a really hostile environment in hot springs. They've done it through horizontal gene transfer, I'll focus on today. They've done it through uh, uh, subtelomeric gene duplications where they harvest the horizontally transferred genes which undergo duplication and slowly enter into the regulatory pathways and they've undergone further genome reduction. So these are all the reasons why they're really cool from an evolutionary point of view. So this is the sort of the current extremophilic cyanidiophyce tree of life with the Galdiorales. And there's even a really cool group of mesophiles called cave cyanidium with an unpronounceable name that my friend Juan Su gave it, uh, as well as the cyanidium and the cyanidiostizon lineage. So we did our work at Lemonade Creek in Yellowstone National Park, which I'll talk about today, as well as with cultures that are available from around the world. And in our past work has shown that these red algae have something we refer to as the 1% rule. That is that by 1% of the gene inventories derived from prokaryotic sources. So it's really exciting to see how, how gene transfer can drive adaptation in genomes that are quite small, 14 to you know, 15 megabases in size and living in really hostile environments. And I should tell you that the real world of Sandy Dufice is most exciting in the field, but in the lab, conditions, they've been used by a lot of people for understanding heterotrophy for, you know, all the sort of the typical production platforms because they're easy to grow, they grow rapidly and they're very resistant. You can grow them at, you know, 41 degrees easy. And so, so they tend to be, it's e easy to keep the muni algal in clean. So there's a huge sort of, a, sort of literature on the culture-based analysis of these guys. And also very excitingly, our friend Shinya Miyagishima has now developed genetic tools. He found a sexual and a, a sort of an asexual phase in which the haploid phase, he was able to develop uh, gene expression, disruption and selective markers. So we have a lot of potential here. So the story I'll talk about today and I'll point out some really cool genes. This is the next step in all this is to actually look at uh, by doing gene knockdowns and seeing what those genes, if they do what we predict they do. 
So I've got two vignettes for you, uh, AGT and genome evolution, and then our work in Yellowstone, which has just started. So you'll have to be super patient and kind. This is the first time we've actually presented this data, but I hope it gives you an idea of why this kind of work is very, very exciting to do. So this interest in horizontal gene transfer and how we justified having a lot of data collected from this group is based on work I did with uh, Andreas Weber in Dusseldorf. In 2019, we published a paper based on 10 nanopore derived genomes of uh, species of Galdieria, where we showed that many of the key features that confer poly extremophily, the ability to live in very low pH, high temperature, heavy metal uh, 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 concentrations and so on, is actually stolen from bacteria. So they're, they're musophilic, uh, sisters, when they adapted to life here, you can see the sorts of pathways of uptake of carbon protein, of uh, uh, uptake of glycerol for you know controlling the solute concentrations, all sorts of stuff. So this is really interesting. These are not bacteria; these are bona fide eukaryotes, but they actually behave in a way like sort of adaptable bacteria, and that's one of the things that makes them really interesting. And I'm not going to say this, but I've, I've been. I've been screaming horizontal gene transfer for eukaryotes for years, and people often say, ah, that's nonsense, it never happens. Uh, Dewey and I wrote an article which says, yeah, it happens a lot. And now, actually, I think it's pretty common. You see the papers on gene transfer eukaryotes all the time, origin of plants, fungi, you name it. But there was a time <laughs> 20 years ago when that was sacrilegious to say that horizontal gene transfer is an important aspect of eukaryotic evolution. Now we kind of accept that as being uh, a fact of life, of evolutionary life. All right, so, but horizontal transfer is fun to think about, but we should think about some hypotheses we can test with it. So one of the ones I want to touch on today is that you have a horizontal gene transfer that comes in, confers an adaptive function. If that stressor goes away, that gene gets lost because it's no longer useful. But if that gene gets integrated to other stressor or other related pathways, then it can survive. So that's a key aspect of the horizontal gene transfer story. Are they maintained? If they're maintained, do they become involved in other pathways and start to take a broader role in the biology of the cell? I call this the integrated HGT model, and I'll talk about how the data that we've collected provides some interesting support for the idea. So how do you choose pathways to look at that should give you a really clear answer? Well, you choose something like uh, heavy metal detoxification, in this case, um, uh, arsenic and mercury, because those are things that are prevalent in the environment. There are known genes that confer the capacity to detoxify or to extrude those uh, heavy metals. And so Julia did some experiments. She's shown here on the bottom right. She did, did a huge amount of heavy lifting in this uh, project. So kudos to her. And, she's, and she, by growing these cultures in different amounts of uh, these two metals, she was able to come up with reasonable sort of uh, treatments for doing RNA-seq and metabolomics. So in this case, for um, sodium arsenide, it was five millimolar. And for mercury chloride, it was three micromolar. The important thing to note here is that these guys are called Galderia sulfuraria. They come from the opposite sides of the world, and they're about five to 600 million years separate. So the taxonomy of these guys is not very clear. Clearly, they're very, very diverse. So they have the same name, but the, Wyand, the Yellowstone and the Taiwan uh, strains are actually very different from each other. So what she did, it's just a really standard experiment where she had four time points, one hour, one day, three days, and one week, and she collected all the samples. So we have reference genomes for these guys, and so they were sent to the JGI for uh, RNA-seq and for metabolomics. The RNA-seq stuff is done. The metabolomics is still going to be done with Ben, um, Trent, and the team here. So, uh, so how does arsenic resistance work in prokaryotes? So everything I'll talk about, all the genes, they're all of prokaryotic origin in the cyanidophyce. So usually you have arsenide that comes in uh, the pentavalent form, and it is then converted to the trivalent arsenite with the RC gene shown up here. That then is converted by through uh, methyl transferase into a methyl arsenide trivalent form, which is really toxic. And then that needs to be either uh, needed to either cut the methyl group off through RSI, or it has to be turned into the, le the less toxic pentavalent methyl arsenide. So that's the standard sort of uh, uh, pathways in prokaryotes. So we have real targets. Now, how these metals come in and out of the cell, we have lots of potential transporters but I'm a little afraid to say much about them because we don't have validation that, that they're doing what we think they're doing, but I think we have some ideas about that. So the, the mercury is much easier. There's a single gene, Murray, in the middle that can convert uh, the ionic form uh, uh, to the elemental form, which can diffuse out of the cell. 
So that's a much simpler, potentially a one gene, one function uh, pathway. Okay, so if you look for these genes within a bunch of sequence genomes of sine Uphysi, with the genes on the top and their numbers and presence absence in the boxes, and here are the two strains that I've talked about, the, the Yellowstone strain um, and the, um, they'll be called 5572 and SAG21 from now on. So both of them have one copy of the Murray gene, which is shown on the bottom left. They do not have the arsenide gene. They don't have a, have a, have a methyl transferase for arsenide. And they have a number of RS8 genes. Okay, so that's what they have in the cell. What's interesting, and I'll point out here that they're missing the RSM. And in the Yellowstone environment, we know that Galgeria lives with lots of sandy disguise on, which has the RSM gene. Just keep that in mind as we move to the actual environmental omics data. Okay, so that's the story. RC is there, RSM is not there, RSH is there, RSH is a member of the gene family. So the first thing she looked at is the RC gene. So she added, she, she did not want to handle arsenate, so she put in arsenite, sodium arsenite. So you see a weak upregulation of the RC gene. Uh, we think most likely what's happening is that there is a couple of uh, aquaplusroporins that are known to transport arsenite. We think the arsenite gets in the cell likely directly through these transporters. This weak upregulation of the RC gene. So there's no RSM gene, and and so there are two SAM dependent methyl transferases in the in the SAG21 strain that show a very strong upregulation. We postulate that maybe these are the methyl transferases that are doing the job to get our, to get arsenite along to the less toxic form. And again, I point out that cyanidiskyzon has an arsen gene which could fill this function. The RSH, all five of them show strong upregulation in the presence of arsenide as shown here. Um, so they're either directly or indirectly involved in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the resistance to sodium arsenide and its forms within the cell. Just to point out to you the, the vast difference in the complexity of these two responses. Uh, for the mercury chloride, you see either a 3.3 or 5.8 fold in uh, upregulation uh, up in, in the two strains. When it's not there, genes not expressed and it's rapidly detoxified to the elemental form, then it kind of goes away. So that's a very simple, straightforward response where we believe the Murray gene is carrying this out, as shown here. So here's the hypothesis. Uh, the, there's two ways. So the Murray gene should be what's called a low connectivity gene. It has a single function and it should be behaving and should not, should not be part of a large co-expression module. The arsenide genes, if the RSH, for example, if they are all related, they should be in the same module connected to each other because they're co-regulated in the presence of sodium arsenide. That's the hypothesis we would put forth for, this, uh, for these data, and it's exactly not the case. So the RSH genes, three of, uh, four of them are shown in that top turquoise module. They're actually within and the edges of a network in which they are surrounded by ribosomal proteins. So these are, these RSH genes are related, have strong co-expression, with genes involved in protein translation. The RSH, the other RSH gene is within a module also at the edge, which is full of photosynthesis related uh, uh, genes. For example, like uh, PSPQ in, in the oxy involving complex chlorophyll by synthesis. This is completely not what we expect. We expect them to be all together responding in a unified, uniform fashion to sodium arsenide. And the RC gene is in a module full of redox stress uh, sort of responsive genes like heat shock proteins and glutathione metabolism. The other strain, 5572, same thing happens. The RSA gene is in a mixed uh, module with lots of what are called dark genes. We already heard about dark genes from, from Igor. And the RC gene is also in a module full of protein translation related genes. Again, not what we expect under the hypothesis. This is a sort of coordinated response to uh, arsenide in the medium. So what are the functions of the RSA proteins? in Galdi area. We don't know, do they fit this model? That they've taken on novel functions that might be predicted by the IHM. They're definitely responsive to arsenide, but also associated with key algal pathways unrelated to metal detoxification. There's evidence from Pseudomonas that these proteins can also play a role in sensing and quenching oxidative stress. So maybe that's the function they've taken on in uh, the Galdi area species. So just to point out to you that <laughs> When we look at the alignment of these uh, proteins from the SAG1 strain, we find something really interesting. So two of them, so here in the red and the green, you can ignore the rest of it, are the two key uh, cofactor binding domains, flavin mononucleotide in red and the NADPH binding in green. 
two of them are, one of them lacks both and one of them lacks uh, the, uh, uh, the flavin, uh, uh, one of them has the flavin mononucleotide binding site. So that's, these are members of the same gene family. And if you look at where they are in the, in the modules, the ones that have lost these domains are actually part of the protein translation module, suggesting that they might actually have taken on novel functions the locations, their low expression and position at the edges of networks fits the hypothesis of genes that are taking on novel functions and therefore are not within the hubs of networks because they're not yet strongly regulated within the organism. Okay, so that's a little bit confusing and little, but also a little bit informative data from the culture work. What does the environment tell us? That's how are these things actually function in the environment? And so with this really exciting project we've been doing with the JGI uh, covering multi-omics, we looked at three sites and Tim McDermott, our good buddy from Montana State did all the uh, sample collection and processing and sent it to us, uh, an aqueous stream and acidic surface soil and endolithic habitat at Lemonade Creek in Yellowstone National Park. And there we have uh, short read metagenomic data from four uh, samples from each site, metatranscriptomic data, both poly A and rich neurotomitis by four time points, untargeted and targeted metabolomic data. This is all, a lot of this is sitting and we're actually very excited about the next steps here. So Tim Stevens has come here with me, fantastic postdoc. He did so sort of the, the MAG assemblies. He found Sinidiosciazone on, on Galderia as we expected, but he also was able to assemble 36 archaeal, 138 bacterial, and five eukaryotic genomes to high or to moderate completion. So these MAGs then became the reference sort of genome for looking at gene expression and distribution of species and whatnot. So surprise number one. So so Sandy Disguison is famous for being the weak, the weakling in the Sandy de, in the Sandy de Ficey because they're cell wall-less, they're obligate photoautotrophs, and people have always considered them in culture to be much sort of deficient to Galdiaria, which has a capacity to, to use up to 50 different kinds of fixed carbon, grow in the dark for you know, you know, for weeks, you know, loses pigmentation, do perfectly fine. Turns out in Yellowstone National Park, Galdiaria is barely there. So here you see, you'll see that. This is dominated by prokaryotes in blue and green, archaea in green, bacteria in blue, and the rest of the sites, including the endolithic site where we define the first Galdiaria flagrea, sort of the rock loving sort of uh, Galdiaria, it's also dominated by Sinidis Dizon. So, this obligate photoautotroph with a tiny genome is actually the dominant member of the algal flora at Yellowstone National Park at these three sites, at least in October 2020. And if you look at the ribo minus gene expression, just as an example, just to show you that a lot of the data is dominated by bacteria. We haven't looked at any of this in detail, but you can see that at the ribo gene expression at the Galderia shown in orange and the sine disguise on in red, they show expression. So we have a nice rich data set to look at in detail about the interactions between prokaryotic and eukaryotic domains of life. So the, here's the other big surprise, sine disguise on, which is an obligate photoautotroph. Uh, uh, if you look at the, you know, the expression values, you know, mapped against, uh, ma uh, mapped to that, uh, to that reference assembly, you see a clear peak at midday when the photosynthetic cells should be doing their thing. Galdieri sulfuraria, which grows beautifully as a photoautotroph in the lab, actually doesn't, <laughs> it has highly suppressed growth in gene expression, and it tends, the gene expression ticks up at night. So these have inverse relationships, even though both of them are really good you know, completely uh, complete photoautotrophs with the capacity to grow photoautotrophically. They don't do this in Yellowstone National Park. The data uh, from the creek biofilm is weaker for the Galde area because there's so few there. It looks somewhat similar, but we have less confidence in that result, but still the sandy disguise on is a photosynthetic driver of these environments. And that can be shown here when you map the transcripts to the uh, genomes of sandy disguise on, you see that Photosynthesis is high at midday. You see that the accumulation of mRNAs actually are the highest when the sandy disguise on is most active photosynthetically in both the creek and the soil biofilms. Okay, so do the RNA seq data from culture work and the environment align for metal detoxification? So first look first uh, look at the creek biofilm data. So the murray gene is behaved just like in the so it's a single gene. It can't be broken up. It, it's either there or it's not. And so the bacteria shown in in, in blue and the sandy disguise on dominate the uh, the uh, transcript numbers within uh, within the creek biofilm. 
we find that there's some evidence of bacterial transporters that are highly abundant in these habitats. They also go up during the day shown here. The RC gene, which is the, this first step in the pathway is dominated by bacteria. Surprise, surprise, Sandy Dustizon is a major provider of the RSM gene product shown here in red. It goes up during the day. So it is clearly playing a key role in that in the middle of the pathway in methyl transferase. And at the end of the day, the RS8 genes and Valdiria go up. So we have a really modular sort of community level response. In soil data, it's more complicated, but very similar. We see that there's a lot of transporters. The San Diego Sky Zone is still providing the largest number of RSM encoding gene products during the day. So we have really sort of species doing complementary things within the environment to uh, complete this pathway. So, the culture work suggests that mercury detoxification is a one HET and one, uh, one function example with low connectivity. RC detoxification is more complex and looks like uh, these genes have been recruited to serve other functions than sinidiophyse. The imbalance in RC gene expression across phyla may indicate a community level response. That is this, this large, uh, this biofilm community is actually behaving in a, in a communal fashion to uh, detoxify arsenic. This could give us some ideas about how prokaryotes and eukaryotes cooperated in the early earth. And again, HET, which is a small part of the landscape now, was at one time the driver of genome evolution. Once genomes became fully evolved, it now has an accessory role, but I hope I convince you it's a very important role in these environments. So the integrated model for, <laughs> for, uh, for HET uh, sort of establishment shows is shown here with mercury resistance following the one gene sort of model and the uh, in eukaryotes, as the community responds to a particular toxin, the, 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 the genes can diversify, give rise to gene duplications and give rise to novel functions. So I think we have two very different pathways and both of them inform us about the evolution of genomes and uh, life in extreme environments. I will not show you that. I will end by thanking Tim here to show it my two kids many years ago in Yellowstone National Park, teaching them how to take the pH of, uh, of some water there. I want to thank the folks who fund us. I want to thank the JGI for supporting this project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dubashish. We have time for some questions. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. I'm curious um, how often you see like single gene horizontal transfers versus multiple genes or you know how, how large can it get and um, secondary to that have you looked at how the structures of such transfers have changed over time for example do they gain introns and things like that yeah we have all that data we have lots of trees that sort of show the the, the pattern of gene i just didn't want to show it here so so for the you know uh, for most of these genes there are multiple uh, entries independent entries the into gene some genes go back a billion years there are two independent origins of the murray gene and, and the sinai alias so it's a really patchwork sort of distribution of how these genes originate and they have very different so the operon structure is long gone they're distributed throughout the genome uh, and so they they behave like eukaryotic genes they have introns these guys have often very few introns they have introns they, they are bona fide eukaryotic genes so we, we we spend a lot of time making sure that we were right on those points. And I'm more than happy to share the tweets with you to, to support that stuff. But it has a very complicated history. And I, I think the most important thing about the complicated history is if you believe what I just talked about, that is that when you have mercury in the environment, the mercury gene comes in and, and the al alga survives, mercury goes away, the, the gene goes away. For it to survive the next time it comes, you have to have horizontal gene transfer. I take that as the first time you can start to think about the episodes of these metals or whatever the trait is in the environment and how they pattern of horizontal gene transfer across lineages can start to tell us something about the environmental conditions that drove the fixation of those genes. I take that as one of the most important things we've learned here, uh, but yes. Great, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, I think uh, Drew sort of asked my question, but I'll just uh, ask a little more pointedly. Do you think any of these came in as operons at the beginning? Right, so one of the, so, so there is a regular, there's a repressible RSR that's found in all bacteria. It's not found in any of these guys. So we, we think when we look at the trees, they look to have independent origins, but of course it could have been horizontally <laughs> transferred and, uh, and, and assembled in the bacterial progenitor. So these are really tough questions over the billion years that we're looking at. We seen have no, so one of the projects that I 
didn't have time to talk about is, so Julia is doing a camera analysis and she's actually found evidence of uh, recent DNA transfer. So she's looking using alien DNA analyses She's found evidence, not of genes, but of bits of DNA moving between bacteria and moving between bacteria and the sunny device. And that was one of our major goals to show that at Yellowstone, where we see this long-term AGT pattern, we can actually show movement of DNA at one time point. So she's building that argument. So I think that's something that will help us get a little bit more sophisticated about this stuff. So kind of building off of that, like there must be a time delay between like the entry of a like an operon or, or, or genes and the ability for expression to be developed yeah. in those genes. So like, how, like, like what is that, that time delay? Yeah, so, so this is like one of the, so, so the nuts and bolts about this. So another project I had my slide, we found a boatload of viruses there. So, so there's an NASA postdoc in my lab named Felipe, he's characterizing them, he's looking for connections of viruses, maybe, maybe moving genes. Many of the viruses are actual algal DNA viruses. The first extremophilic, algal viruses described. To your question, what happens in the eukaryotic case and almost all cases with, with larger genomes, the genes land wherever they land. And if there's weak transcription across there, then they might get weakly expressed. And so there is a time for that gene under low expression to potentially have a beneficial impact. And over time, you find the regulation steps up. Now the time, I don't know the time frame of it. We have examples of it over you know, 100 million years. But, but, but the sequence of events usually is an operon lands, gets broken up, and then over time, they're weakly expressed, just like those RS8 genes at the edge of the networks. And then over time, they get more strongly regulated, get more within the hubs of networks. So we think, and then they gain the eukaryotic features of same amino acid you know, composition, whatever, all that stuff that happens. So yeah, I, I don't know the exact time frame, but those are the sort of the qualitative things that happen from bacteria to active genes. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that so you're asking the question that really really fascinates me as a symbiosis biologist. We, I think Igor somewhat suggested we worked on endosymbiosis and integration for years. I think of the hot spring as a symbiotic thing. So if you imagine it, you know, if you go to Yellowstone, you know, here, that's a hot spring. I mean, it's kind of ash and soil, but it's not the same. These are islands of productivity within a very large landscape. So, I, so what we're finding in the community response here, we think is actually because of the, you know, they're isolated and therefore they have to rely, rely on, on each other and these functions bleed into growth and all other aspects. I suspect that a much larger analysis of these genes across the world would be a wonderful way to figure out whether we have convergence on all these fronts or whether different lineages find different solutions to it. But that's something that's really in our minds for the future. Hey, uh, really cool talk. Um, so many prokaryotes can use um, things like arsenic as a respiratory substrate. Do you think there's any evidence that they could potentially be using these not to just to detoxify, but to use for like redox balance or respiration? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We have nothing in those directions yet. Um, yeah, we should have a chat about how the best way to, to do that. Um, so what I just wanted to point this out to you is that, is that if you just follow my fantasy on the symbiotic uh, hot spring, what we see with the RSH, where it's leaving its original function and getting parts of other sort of growth related, it tells us, and, and also with the redox related, and it could well be something more sophisticated than what I'm saying. We see that the toxin response over long term leads into the entire growth of the, of the, of the hot spring. So really, they're all sharing the ability to detoxify arsenide, we postulate. And therefore, these genes in the eukaryotes can duplicate and they start to take on functions. So in a way, in a way they're kind of growing, you know, in... Uh, in a coordinated fashion, that the, that the toxin is driving the evolution of the hot springs and the cells in it. And that's the part that I get really excited about is the fact that eukaryotes use something bad and turn it into something that can be used to, to create a landscape of stability and growth over time. Uh, and what you're suggesting could well be one of the things that they're doing with that uh, element. 